My name is Bill Strickland. I was born in Boston, went to Harvard, and joined the movement when I was head of the NAACP at Harvard. And one of the things that I did as head of the NAACP was to invite Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer up because the talk in those days was all about Mississippi, which was called the state. And I wanted my students and the university to know what Mississippi was really like. So I invited Mrs. Hamer up, and she came for a couple of days and gave a talk. And then as she was leaving, she said, Bill, why don't you come to Mississippi? And I said, you want me to come to Mississippi? <laughs> and she said, yes. And so I did. I, I left Cambridge and went, to, and went to Mississippi. And that was my real, and I had been involved in NAACP and stuff in Boston in Cambridge, actually. Um, but that was my real introduction to the Southern Movement, to go to Mississippi. And I lived in Atlanta for several years. And Martin Luther King's death in 1968 came in the midst of a crisis of meaning and direction, both for himself and for the black struggle of which he was so significant a part. In Atlanta, a year following his death, an attempt was made to honor his memory and further his legacy by establishing the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Center, one of, the, of whose components was the Institute of the Black World, the first modern and independent black think tank dedicated, in Coretta Scott King's words, quote, to analyze with uncompromising insistence the problems and needs which face black people today. Defining their mission as developing scholarship in the service of struggle the group of national and international scholars and scholar activists at IBW sought to provide an intellectual underpinning to the burgeoning black consciousness and black studies movement and most especially to study black and American history for their respective insights on the struggles of the past and the possible nature of the struggle to come. How IBW came into being and how it attempted to develop a perspective on history and current events that would inform the struggle for liberation is the story that I shall try and sketch out here as accurately as memory permits. But this personal journey of reflection should in no way be construed as a definitive history of IBW. That totality is, I think, spiritually impossible to recover because so much of IBW was an experiment in hope and defiance, so much a shared belief in new possibilities, and so much a fulfilling sense both of being useful to others and of mapping out new vistas of knowledge. One can only concur with the sentiment expressed in a documentary on, I think, the Montgomery movement that called that period, quote, a mighty, mighty time, unquote. The origins of the Institute of the Black World were due to Martin Luther King's friend and associate, Vincent Harding. Martin Luther King's legacy and spirit was represented in the personage of his friend and fellow combatant for peace, Vincent Harding. Like Martin, Vincent believed in the power of nonviolent social change and, unlike some of the rest of us, in the possibility of the redemption of sinners. In the late 1950s, while studying for his PhD in history at the University of Chicago and working with an, an interracial congregation in the pacifist Mennonite Church, Vincent and a group of fellow congregants toured the South to witness the civil rights movement firsthand. In 1960 or 1961, Vincent and Rosemary, his wife and co-partner in the struggle, returned to Atlanta to establish the Mennonite House a pacifist, and during the Vietnam War, a draft counseling center. Serendipitously, the Hardings chose to live in the same Vine City neighborhood as Martin and Coretta King, and the two families became close friends. Given their ideological and religious kinship, it was almost inevitable that Martin would ask Vincent to join him in his various desegregation efforts in the South. Indeed, in Albany, Georgia, Vincent was arrested for leading a late-night prayer protest at City Hall after Marion King, the pregnant wife of Albany leader Slater King, had been knocked down and kicked by Albany policemen. 
So Vincent was not an armchair ph philosopher about, quote, the struggle. He had witnessed it, quote, up close and personal in some of its most malevolent forms. In 1965, after co completing his dissertation at the University of Chicago, Vincent accepted the position as head of the Department of History and Sociology at Spelman College at the invitation of President Albert Manley. What is even more curious is that Vincent made no secret of his political leanings, telling President Manley, Spelman's first black president, that he, Vincent, was going to be working outside the institution, inside the institution, and around the institution in a way that would sometimes challenge the institution. True to his word, Vincent continued working outside the institution principally but not exclusively with Martin Luther King. Their most significant collaboration was in Martin's famous Declaration of Independence from L LBJ's war in Vietnam, which he delivered at the Riverside Church in New York on April 4th, 1967, exactly a year to the day before his assassination in Memphis. That day, 67, Martin broke ranks with the administration and other civil rights leaders to point to the palpable contradictions of the Vietnam War. We were taking the black young men who had been crippled by our society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia and East Harlem. So we have been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same schools. It was this Martin Luther King, the speaking truth to power Martin Luther King, who Vincent carried in his heart and whose legacy he hoped IBW would further. Thus, as 1968 dawned, pregnant with the explosive events that were about to erupt in black and white America, then Martin was killed. Soon after the funeral, Mrs. King asked Vincent to take leadership in the creation of the Martin Luther King Library Documentation Project, mm -hmm. planned as the major documentation center for the post-1954 movement. Harding, and in the course of those discussions, Vincent proposed that the Institute for Advanced Ameri Afro-American Studies be included in the King Center as well. Later that year, WCBS-TV in New York asked Vincent and John Henry Clark to develop a series on black history for their, for their station. The series was called Black Heritage, and it consisted of merely 100 lectures given by some 30 lecturers and ran from November 1968 through February Black History Month of 1969. Several of those presenters, James Boggs, Lerone Bennett, Sterling Stuckey, A.B. Spellman, Gerald McWhorter, Bill Strickland, along with Vincent Harding, would go on to play key roles in the planning and subsequent development of the Institute, and Black Heritage would serve as a model for one of the Institute's most successful programs, the Summer Research Symposium. Mm -hmm. On Monday, September 15th, the Institute of the Black World began its official existence. The public opening ceremony, a celebration of blackness, was held on January 17, 1970, the Saturday after Martin Luther King's birthday. The Institute versus the King Center, the original research fellows of the Institute, came from both inside and outside Atlanta. <coughs> Steve Henderson, for example, continued to teach at Morehouse, but he also offered a seminar at IBW on contemporary black poetry and perspective while other Atlanta residents served on IBW's advisory council. From Chicago came Lerone Bennett Jr. on leave from Ebony Magazine and Sterling Stuckey, a former history teacher, then working on his dissertation at Northwestern University. Bill Strickland came from New York where he was a lecturer in history and politics at Columbia University's Urban Studies program, while Chester Davis, an expert on black education, joined the staff from Sir George Williams University in Montreal. Joyce Ladner, a former SNCC stalwart who had just received her degree in sociology from Washington University, came to Atlanta from St. Louis and rejoined her sister Dory, another SNCC veteran who was living in the city. 
Vincent now severed his ties with Spelman in order to don his new hat as director of the Institute, in addition to his responsibility as director of the overall Memorial Center. Then, with everyone in place, the work of the Institute began on two fronts, teaching and research. Seminars, seminars were offered like Steve's seminar on black poetry, and Vincent taught a course on black biography. Chester conducted a session on black children in public education, an analysis of theories and practices, and Bill taught black radical politics in the 20th century, 1895 to 1945. Joyce led an independent study on the black family and social policy, but their main task, the task that brought them all together, was of course the re-examination of the history. So the IBW staff began to probe the history of blacks in America and the diaspora, and especially the history of the black struggle that had begun in Montgomery and died according to most characterizations with Martin in Memphis. But as they dug into that history anew and took note of the different strata of black folk who had taken part in the movement over time and how that movement had spread from the southern working class and church folk in Montgomery to southern and then northern black students and even to young white folk who saw the black struggle as something they could join, imitate, or ally with. They began to appreciate just how unprecedented that struggle had been, that never before in American history had black people challenged the society for so long and so unremittingly in every walk of life and in every part of the land. From rent strikes to school boycotts, from sit-ins and wait-ins and peaceful marches to armed struggle. The crystallization of the IBW vision, articulated in its first black paper, the Challenge of Blackness by Lerone Bennett as a center for defining, defending, and illustrating blackness, soon put it at loggerheads with the board of directors of the Martin Luther King Center, who were already discomforted that two of its members had been among those trustees of the Atlanta University schools who had been locked in the university hall by students demanding that the Negro schools transform themselves into black institutions that two members of IBW's planning staff had taken part in the protest only added to the board's skepticism about IBW's ideology and politics. Consequently, when the board proposed that IBW narrow its focus to Martin hagiography, be sensitive to the feelings of Atlanta's black leadership, and perhaps even consider taking a pledge on nonviolence, the IBW staff felt they had to take a stand. So, in a written communique to the board, they made it clear that there, was some, that there were some things about which they felt so strongly that if agreement on them were not reached, then their relationship to the center would have to be reevaluated. The five principles they insisted upon were the academic freedom of staff, fellows, and students of the institute, that policies and commitments made not be blithely sacrificed to what is expedient or to what non-blacks think is right, any concept of a loyalty oath as a condition of association or involvement with the Institute of the Black World be absolutely rejected, as well as any rule that the Institute be circumscribed by the parochial concerns of the Atlanta area or hindered from developing ties with all the people of the African diaspora. That all agree that the life of Martin Luther King Jr. belongs to black people born and unborn, as does his dedication to the struggle for black freedom and self-determination. That is the bond we, f we feel to him, and we feel that those who would distort the meaning of that life for their own narrow interests are his enemies and ours too. It soon became evident that a parting of the ways was unavoidable. So in March of 1970, IBW struck out on its own. Prior to the separation, however, IBW had hosted a Black Studies Directors Conference attended by some 35 directors from across the country. It had hosted talks by Margaret Walker Alexander and Horace Caton on the life and work of their friend Richard Wright. The International Dimension had been affirmed in a two-week visit by the Trinidadian writer, critic, and Renaissance man C.L.R. James, who gave the first W.E.B. Du Bois lecture, and by the coming on to the staff of Robert Hill, the Jamaican-born scholar, activist, and expert on Marcus Garvey. Then through Bobby, IBW met and forged lasting ties with the brilliant young Guyanese historian, Walter Rodney, 
who had recently been barred by the government of Jamaica from returning to his post at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. As time has passed, the study of IBW has itself become an historical project with younger scholars seeking to locate us within the, tra the trajectory of the Black Power Movement. But none of us at the time thought of ourselves and our work as furthering the Black Power cause per se. Rather, we believe, like Frederick Douglass, that he who, has, quote, that he who has suffered the lash should be he who cries out, that those who had so often been defined by others should now define themselves. So although we absolutely were for black empowerment and were deeply involved in the black studies and black consciousness trends, I think it is more accurate to say that IBW represented something different, a black perspective, black analysis movement. That, I think, more precisely captures who we were and what we were about.